Hi, good morning, guys. It's Mark Dawes here. It's Friday the 4th of March. And if you've been following some of our blog posts this week, you know I've been blogging on the issue of vicarious liability on some stuff that's been put up on Facebook and has been out there in the press, particularly the Morrison's case where a member of staff assaulted, basically, a member of the public and Morrison's was held liable for that assault because of their vicarious liability, the relationship between what they were asking their member of staff to do and the actions that they carried out in actually committing the assault on a member of the public. There's also another case that was read at the same time in the Supreme Court, which is Cox versus the Ministry of Justice. And I've actually put the findings or the press release from the Supreme Court on our website, which you can actually go to and have a look at, which is uh, nfps.info forward slash blog. And you can read the actual findings from the press release from the Supreme Court because it's very, very interesting. Now, in terms of us as training providers, and for those of you that commission training, this has massive implications because you know if we don't train staff properly or if we don't provide them with the right equipment or the right kit or the right policies and the right instruction and guidance or monitor and supervise them, then that leaves organisations you know wide open. The claims of vicarious liability should a member of staff or indeed you know a service user or member of the public become injured and bring an action against the organisation. So this is tightening up the whole system really. Uh, and it's probably, you know, in some ways a good thing because it's going to make people do what they should have done in the first place, which is actually put systems, processes, equipment and training in place that's actually fit for purpose. So if you're panicking about this, that's probably a good thing because it's about, you know, it's probably time you went and actually reviewed what you're doing and, and we're doing this all the time. So let me take you through a couple of things. Bear with me while I just click this thing up here and bring this up because I, I want to really sort of focus on some of the things that will have a bearing on what you need to look at and what you can advise your clients on, or if you are an, an organisation looking at this, what you need to consider. One of the things that came out of the press release from the Supreme Court uh, it was this. They said that a range of measures should be considered, including training and the implementation of suitable policies. Now, that might sound like a, a pretty you know standard thing. We all should be aware of that. But they've actually realised that in both cases where the staff were asked to do stuff there was not very clear guidance or policy or indeed training on what they were supposed to do in fact a lack of so let's just go through this and have a look at this and i've knocked up a little bit of a model for you you know it's it's not um set in stone but it's just something to, to make you think about what we should be doing or what organizations should be doing so the first thing here is, is does the member of staff have contact with patients, service users, members of the public? So are we employing care staff, NHS staff, healthcare assistants, dormers, super security officers, whatever? If the answer to that is yes, then do clear policies and guidance exist that relate to the employee's role? So in other words, are we you know, very clear on what we want them to do? And as I've said in the last video, you can go back to the Hawley versus um, Luminar Leisure case. In fact, there was a, a case with Stringfellas as well where even if you're employing subcontracted staff, you are, for the sake of legislation, the employer for health and safety purposes, and you must be very clear on what you're asking subcontracted staff to do. If the answer to that is yes, and we have policies, or if the answer to that is no, we still have to provide training. So has training been provided to allow the employee to do their job? And we know that lots of organisations do provide training. Now, some don't, because they have policies that say you can't touch. Now, if you have a, a can't touch policy, but staff are touching, then it's a, not, it's a null and void policy. Because if staff are touching in the best interest of service users, patients, members of the public, whatever, to keep people safe, and you have a no touch policy, then you're still vicariously liable for what your you know staff are doing. So it's best to address this head on. But let's go back to the training bit. You know, do, has training been provided? Yes, it may be the case that training has been provided, or as, and as you may have seen from previous blog posts. Training will be provided sometimes, not that's fit for purpose, but to keep other people happy. So the next question is, is does the training equip the employee to do their job competently and safely? So in other words, does it cover the full range of what the employee is expected to do in undertaking their, their job role? So it's a, if it's a physical skills thing, does the training go far enough? For example, does it incorporate restrictive techniques if restrictive techniques are required? Or does it omit them if they're not required? In other words, the training has to fit the purpose. It has to fit and, and be able to actually allow the employee to undertake their job to the required competent standard. Next question is, if equipment is required, has it been provided? And as you've seen from various blog, blog posts, I've come across agencies that say, yes, we need equipment, but the organization won't give us the equipment 
purely based on the fact is they don't think it would look nice. Uh, now, whether it looks nice or not is not the issue, is if the equipment is required, is it being provided? Because if it's not being provided and the training isn't enough to allow staff to, to physically manage people, then if people get injured as a result of that, the employer is vicariously liable. Then the, th the further question we have to ask is, are staff being supervised properly? In other words, are we giving them all this stuff and just letting them get on with it, as does happen? Uh, and then saying, look, it's down to you, it's your responsibility. No, it's not. Health and Safety at Work Act states quite clearly that staff should be given information, instruction, training and supervision. So we need to make sure that what they're doing is being reviewed and monitored and amendments and changes being implemented where necessary. Which is the next part. Is the whole process being regularly monitored and reviewed? Uh, and I think I've covered that already. Then, is everything based on a suitable and sufficient assessment of risk? Because you need something to act as a hub from where you can actually make these decisions from. Because you don't just put training in place, you need to, to find out what training you need and to what extent that training should extend to. So, you know, your model for that should be a very good risk assessment model. So when I was talking to someone the other day and they were saying, yes, we need to do this and we're looking at that and we're going to drill for this and drill for that, my question was, that's great, what does the risk assessment say? And the reason this is important is, if the case goes to court, as in a vicarious liability case, your risk assessment is going to be a very, very important piece of documentation that you want to take along to justify why you did or did not do something. And in one case recently, or one situation, should I say, not a case, it wasn't a court case, it was actually a, a meeting, there was a particular inspector there that was very against um, certain equipment being used. And the solution to that was we'd identified it in the risk assessment. So we said, here's the risk assessment. Kindly sign the risk assessment saying that you will not allow us to use this equipment because it, we've identified it as being needed. If you don't want it done because you're going to sanction or downgrade or whatever, sign the document. That way we have a line of causability back to you because basically it's duress and if you want me to be blunt, it's bullying. Uh, and they, they obviously wouldn't sign the document and the net effect of that was they said, well, okay, you know, in this instance we can see you've done good work, etc., etc. You carry on with it. We could carry on with it anyway. It wasn't the issue. But it does raise the point then of where some inspectorates or some agencies who come and inspect um, have an impact on your liability due to some of the comments and suggestions they make which put you under pressure to do or not do certain things if you get my drift. And the final thing is, is there a clear audit trail of evidence to support everything you're doing? So can you take all your documentation to court? Can you show on a step-by-step -step basis what your justifications are, what your decision-making process for, and evidence why you made those decisions? Because you're going to be asked. If the case goes to court, they're going to ask you this, this stuff. Uh, and you're, it's going to go further than just, you know, yes, there's a, an attendance sheet, there's a certificate of attendance. They're going to want to see why you did stuff, what's the justification for doing stuff, where that justification came from. And if it's down to equipment, they're going to look and see whether or not the equipment you're using uh, is, is the correct equipment, whether it's it's been uh, manufactured to the correct quality standard, whether it's been tested, whether it's been medically reviewed. With, with regards to your training, they'll do the same things. Has your training been medically reviewed? Does it have audits in place? Has it been risk assessed? So they're going to you know go to the finite detail on this. So it's really important that you can actually come pre-prepared. And prior planning on this is, you know, without doubt, really important. So there's a few things for you to think about. I hope that makes sense. Enjoy the blog post and please leave me some comments. I'd be really interested to know what you think or your views on this so I can come back to you with some more stuff. Thanks ever so much. Have a great Friday and have a great weekend.